In this session, we're going to talk a bit about uh, biomarkers and to set out a vision uh, for how using uh, omics uh, driven biomarkers can transform uh, how we approach uh, clinical trials and how we bring them to the, to the bench at the end of the day. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Just to uh, recap, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, my company, GeneStack, we've been running for about uh, eight and a half years. I'm also involved in a nonprofit foundation called Aging Biology Foundation. And uh, prior to starting this company, uh, for more than 10 years, I was, the, I was at the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, leading functional genomics uh, team and uh, setting up a number of uh, research and services projects for the scientific community. So the last 30 years, roughly, have really transformed how sponsors have collected data during clinical trials. Uh, so much so that we often tend to refer to the, the 90s as the age of evolution of clinical technologies. Um, one element of the clinical trial underwent uh, a paradigm shift in the way it was conducted. So data capture moved from paper to electronic. Queries began to be resolved in real time. Data uh, uh, clarification forms uh, in envelopes became a thing of the past. So things we take for granted today uh, at, the, at the turn of the century are a consequence of how we saw and wanted clinical trials um, of the future to work. A number of major players on the market, uh, highly valued companies, um, have emerged as a result of this, of this um, shift. And uh, if I were to summarize it in a word, it's digitalization. So it really has um, you know, transformed where we are. One of the theses that I want to put forward in this presentation is that it's time for a new paradigm shift, uh, one that we are perhaps in the middle of. And uh, uh, one thing that you know, we can um, recap is that uh, the current average cost of bringing a drug to the market has grown, right? Over the last few years, it's hovering somewhere around $2.6 uh, billion. So there is a significant driver in the industry to look for ways about uh, achieving savings uh, and efficiencies in the current state. Um, so we, we know that the, the likelihood of approval is, you know, rates are dipping below uh, 10%, as low as 5% in oncology. At the same time, um, we are uh, repeatedly uh, observing uh, the, the lowering of costs in the production of high throughput data um, in the genetic space. We keep hearing about the promises of precision medicine. And what's uh, even more spectacular is that today, as we are uh, discussing uh, you know, this in the middle of a pandemic, we know that things can be done faster. Things can be done cheaper. Um, we know, you know, both me personally, through our um, collaborations with uh, big pharma and biotechs in the field, that uh, there is a wealth of data out there. You know, we, we know that there is this operation warp speed. We know that we can achieve vaccines quickly. So it is possible. And uh, one of my main thoughts is that uh, sponsors out there are in fact sitting on a gold mine. And uh, on this slide um, in the top right hand corner, I just point out uh, an example from a clinical study that's uh, you know, um, been completed. And uh, you can look at what kinds of data clinical studies uh, collect. So there is the usual suspects, you know, collected in the uh, CRF system. So, you know, common clinical data, demographics, uh, uh, clinical history, personal history, uh, you know, physical examination information. Then you have, you know, disease specific clinical data, uh, you know, things that maybe come in through an unstructured form. Uh, and then you got, you know, uh, the, the labs. So, you know, routine biology, immunochemistry and so on. But then you start seeing that you have these uh, studies that also collect very structured, very deep, very large, and very complex omics data. And so there is more and more of these, right? So we, we know and we, we see that this is happening. Uh, and uh, there is, um, everybody talks about uh, the idea that, you know, clinical trials that leverage the use of 
uh, genetic data that use biomarkers with a genetic component are going to be the way forward. We tend to agree that further advances in these technologies uh, will tailor the industry's understanding of human biology and will improve the capability to deliver targeted therapies. Is this really happening? Right? I think this is an important question to ask, you know, you know what's blocking us? Um, if we look at the numbers, you know, it is pretty convincing, right, that um, with a selection biomarker, you increase uh, approval threefold. However, if we look at the, the number of new studies, you know, that's about between four and uh, four and a half thousand new clinical trials started every year. How many of them use a selection biomarker? We're still hovering between, you know, five and ten percent. Why is this happening? Why is this such a difficult thing? Uh, we know that you need to generate the data. You need to model the data. We know that bioinformatics as a general industry has enabled comprehensive multi-omics and clinical data integration. But the translation of these uh, technologies and these approaches into clinically actionable tool has been slow. So what does the, the, the background look like? Uh, I want you to consider these numbers. So this is coming from our direct uh, experience uh, talking to um, uh, large pharma companies, we see that since the mid-2000s, roughly, when the sequencing of the human genome became readily accessible to industry, sponsors have actually gone ahead and included within their clinical studies an informed consent to include DNA sequencing information on trial subjects. So while this information was not specifically a protocol requirement and it was not part of submission data, the clinical data sets as part of the IND commission generation, this wealth of multi-omics data already exists within many sponsor organizations. Our estimates uh, indicate that a top 25 pharma would have anything from two to 5,000 completed studies over the last 15 years with associated multi-omic data. So this would conservatively translate to anywhere between 400,000 and 600,000 subjects across a broad therapeutic range. So the existence of this high quality, private, retrospective data within a sponsor's environment represents a whole new opportunity uh, on the path towards precision medicine techniques uh, that can be achieved by mining genome sequencing data and related clinical data within a single unified data catalog across multiple uh, studies. So there are systems that are emerging to make this possible. These systems exist. These capabilities exist within the industry. Uh, we at GeneStack have done uh, considerable work in this space. Um, and uh, it's really about uh, making data fair. Uh, it's a principle that um, was announced a few years ago. Um, fair stands for making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, this uh, idea of Creating a data-centric organization, this democratization of data, making data fair, is uh, a major driving principle in this new paradigm shift. So what does it mean? Uh, in this space, we see that there is a need to start looking at uh, clinical trials rather than, as we are looking at them today, as individual projects with a start and an end, be able to look at them as a... Uh, huge gold mine of data which we can query across. So we need an organization needs to start thinking about how do we catalog all of this? How do we present all the uh, subjects that we have come across within one common uh, space so that a researcher planning a new trial can query across these? How do we integrate omics data that tends to sit within a research part of the organization with the uh, subject and, and study and patient level information which sits in the clinical side of the organization. So what is it that would make this possible? Well, the big elephant in the room, if I may, uh, has to do with um, getting the right data, getting clean data and getting well organized data. And uh, this is a theme that is common throughout our industry. It's all about getting good data. And uh, uh, this is about standardizing data. This is about sharing data. Remember, uh, these um, data sets that I discussed, they're currently 
not only locked in uh, private organizations within each pharma company, but within those, they are locked into the context of uh, an existing uh, uh, completed trial. Uh, it is often surprising that when we go to a uh, uh, CIOs of these organizations and uh, simply asking how many subjects do you have on a particular indication who have been through you know clinical trials in the organization, these are these are questions that are hard to answer. So we need to improve uh, and establish drivers for data sharing, and these are around data and metadata standards. So there are. Uh, organizations that are dealing with this. So we know that within CDISC and uh, under the SDTM uh, standard, there is a, uh, a pharmacogenomics initiative. And uh, as you can see, the data is pretty structured. The data is quite complex, but there are many different ways of, of recording this. Uh, there are many different ways of uh, organizing and uh, uh, capturing all the metadata that has to do with each of these um, boxes on the screen, so how we um, identify our genetic observations, how we capture what we mean by gene expression or variation, how we describe our specimens, how we describe our uh, collection protocols. So all of these things are uh, currently needing to be standardized. We see uh, organizations deploying strategies to harmonize and standardize data across uh, their uh, digital organization. And this is something that currently makes data interoperability and data aggregation a challenging task. So when we look at uh, you know, where things are going, uh, we again, it, it's exciting to think about um, you know, the, the clinical trial of the future. And we certainly see current trends of decentralization continuing. We see adaptive and virtual trials, you know, direct patient recruitment growing. We see the use of uh, digital uh, wearables, both as uh, possible endpoints and as biomarkers, as a source of patient reported data or outcomes becoming the norm. But over and above this, uh, one greater and more profound change, which we think will make a more lasting and significant impact on the, the way that we run clinical trials is going to be around um, introducing this large-scale structured data and searching uh, across clinical trials. So if we look at that, what might that look like? What kind of uh, biomarkers would we be looking at? So we're looking at building out uh, more sensitive biomarkers coming from various omics measurements. Uh, there are multiple types of biomarkers biomarkers that indicate the natural history of disease and correlate with clinical indices. We see biomarkers that track the effects of intervention that are associated with the drug mechanism of action. We see surrogate endpoints that predict clinical benefit. So while some of these uh, tie in with biomarker discovery programs and uh, population profiling, we see clinical studies of the future bearing greater dependence upon the, the latter two markers, the marker types, the e efficacy biomarkers and uh, predictive ones. So how would this work? So the way that we, we see it working is um, much in the same way as we're used to uh, hematology results, routinely reported through central labs and integrated into at visit uh, points for patients within the CDMS and EDC systems. We would expect that the subject's DNA get sequenced in defined time points, linked to a study calendar, and then get populated into uh, a specialized cross-study database. And then researchers within organizations would be able to ask questions across studies. What omic signature correlates with the efficacy of a, uh, of a treatment for uh, non-small uh, carcinoma? How does it correlate with smoking status? How does it correlate with uh, lung adenoma patients across a certain geographic region? So being able to ask these questions across studies is really important. If we now look at the data landscape that would drive this, what we see is overall what I have on the screen is a fairly traditional uh, landscape. You see at the center of it the, the EDC system, you see into it subject visits and randomization protocols feeding in, you see coding, you see safety, you see a study visit schedule. But what would be really exciting is 
to for a new box to to appear here. That's one um, on the top right hand screen uh, corner. Uh, so emerging uh, at the top there uh, and joining these various data sources, um, we see this box gaining more significance as a as another source of uh, truth for omics data, linked with study subjects, integrated with the EDC and CTMS system. And this can bring key data points on demand. Uh, it would allow protocol-based biomarker criteria to be captured, record the efficacy of treatment and continuation or discontinuation of the subject. It can significantly uh, shorten um, uh, clinical trials and uh, help with uh, patient recruitment. So this can be uh, a, a really important uh, and uh, uh, paradigm shifting uh, innovation. So where do we go from here? And what is the current state of the art? So today, the electronic data capture systems are not integrated with biomarker data capture systems, while the biomarker systems that are built out for translational research are not really geared for a cross-study cohort selection and advanced analysis. If you look at what's coming from the research domain, you see either, study, either systems that are set up to capture multiple modalities of uh, omics data and be able to explore them within a single study, or you see systems that can do statistical cohort and cross-cohort analysis, but not uh, with the, uh, the context of a complex multi-omic clinically integrated uh, data set. So we have been um, trying to create a vision for a system that would, on the one hand, integrate clinical anomics data from different trials, that would uh, enable users to find new safety, efficacy, and uh, predictive biomarkers from retrospective trials, and use this information to feed into the loop for ongoing trials using omics biomarkers faster. So this is a... Uh, uh, a thought experiment that we have been uh, playing around with, building such systems. And uh, it seems to be um, a, a very effective way of looking at the data. So where do we go from here? What do I want to leave you with? So we need to rethink for sponsors, to rethink study designs and to plan for the future, to recognize, to think ahead and plan for how efficiencies and cost savings can be gained through using omics biomarkers as a viable measurement within study data and time points. Consider that within their IND applications. This is something that we need to increase the number of uh, trials that generate this kind of data. For the research community to embark on um, biomarker discovery programs that can generate the biomarkers that, uh, that um, I've been discussing to demonstrate their effectiveness and to uh, set the groundwork for using them in upcoming clinical studies. And uh, overall, to create uh, jointly a pathway for successful discovery and uh, clinical utilization programs that would allow sponsors and protocol authors to create such study designs uh, so that the data is uh, standardized, harmonized, and shared. If we can achieve this, then we can see um, the promise of the human genome sequencing, the precision medicine promise uh, really uh, be got beginning to be applied uh, to drive precision medicine and bring science from bench to the bedside. Thank you.